Hello, in today's class we will be having a very brief introduction to an operating concept called processes. So the topics which we will cover is from programs to processes, memory maps, uh, system calls, files and uh, uh, essentially the structure of the operating system. Consider this particular program written in C. So this program prints hello world onto the screen. In order to compile and run this program, we first need to uh, use a compiler such as GCC and specify the C code name such as hello.c in this case. And what we will get is an executable. In this case, it is called a.out. This executable is stored uh, on the hard disk. In order to run this particular program, uh, we specify a command like dot slash a.out and it results in a process being created in the RAM. So uh, this process is essentially the a.out program under execution uh, which is present in the RAM. To define it formally, a process is a program under execution which is executed from RAM and uh, essentially comprises of various sections such as the executable instruction stack heap and also a hidden section known as the state. So this state is actually maintained by the operating system and contains uh, various things like the registers, list of open files, uh, process, a list of uh, related processes, etc. So uh, in today's class, we will look more into detail about what this particular process contains and how it is managed. So let us take a very simple example. Uh, so this is a program and this is a process that is created when this program is executed. Now the process has various sections, for example, it has the text, data, heap and the stack. Now various parts of this program when executed get mapped into the various sections of the process. For instance, uh, all the instructions such as the instructions involved in the function main uh, will get mapped into the text section of the process. Um, similarly, uh, other functions such as the fact function over here, the instructions involved in this will also get mapped into the text section. Now the uh, global data and also static data gets um, mapped into the data section of the process. So this uh, section is actually divided into two parts where, uh, called as initialized and non-initialized sections. Third section is the heap. Now any dynamically allocated memory such as m. Uh, which is dynamically allocated using malloc gets created uh, in the heap. Now th the final section is called the stack uh, which contains all the local variables such as n and uh, m and also information about uh, function invocation. For example, in this case we have a recursive function which is getting invoked. So all this information is present in the stack. Now, the, the memory map of a process comprising all of the sections has a maximum limit called the max size. So typically at least in, uh, in processes which are used in typical operating systems these days, uh, this max size is going to be fixed by the OS. For instance, in a 32-bit Linux operating system, the max size for every process is fixed at 0xc followed by 7 zeros. In the xv6 operating uh, system which we are looking at for this course, uh, the max size of a process is fixed at the address 0x8000000. Uh, so what we had seen is that if, uh, every process, uh, a program that is a program under execution gets mapped into an area uh, which starts at 0 and ends at max size. So what is present beyond this max size uh, of the process? So typically, uh, the kernel or the operating system gets mapped to uh, the memory region from the max size to the maximum limit. The entire thing like text, uh, that is the instructions of the operating system, operating system data, uh, the OS heap and also device memory gets mapped into this upper region of the OS. So typically, any user program could access any part of this lower region that is the green region over here. Okay, so th uh, there would, would not be any problem to actually read data from any of these uh, sections or even write data to parts of these sections. But however, uh, uh, the process cannot access any data present in the kernel memory that is beyond the max size limit. 
However, the kernel uh, or the operating system which is executing from this upper region can access data from any part of the region. That is it could execute uh, or access data from uh, in this kernel region as well as in the user space region. Now what happens when we actually have multiple processes running in the same uh, system? So each process would have its own uh, memory map having its own instructions data heap and stack uh, and also the kernel component is also present beyond the max size. So what you see is that every process uh, in the system would have the kernel starting at max size and extending uh, beyond. Only the lower paths and, and this kernel part is going to be same for every process that is executing in the system. Below this max size is going to vary from one process to another. So what does this mean? So uh, what it means is that when you execute one process and then execute an another, another process, the regions above the max size is going to be uh, similar while the regions below the max size is going to change from one process to another. So we mentioned that user programs can uh, will not be able to access any data in the kernel space. So in that case, how does the user program actually invoke the operating system? So there are special invocation functions which the operating system support. Uh, these are known as system calls. So a system calls are a set of functions which the OS support and a user uh, process could invoke any of the system calls to get information or to access hardware or other resources within the kernel. So uh, what happens when a, uh, when a system call is invoked is that a, a process which is generally running in a, uh, in a user mode gets shifted to something known as a kernel mode or a privilege mode which will allow the kernel or the operating system to actually execute. Uh, when the uh, system call completes execution then the user process will resume its execution from where it actually stopped. So let us take an example of the uh, printf statement. So printf in fact is a, a library call. So it is present in this libc and it uh, results in a particular function in the user space uh, known as write to be invoked and this function would then invoke a system call called write uh, with a parameter called std out. So std out is a special uh, parameter which uh, essentially uh, tells the operating system that the string provided by, uh, by printf should be displayed onto the standard output that is the screen. So the write is a system call which causes a trap to be triggered and this trap will result in something known as a trap handler in the kernel space uh, to be executed uh, and uh, the trap handler would then uh, invoke a function which will correspond to the write system call. So this write system call will then be responsible for actually printing uh, the string uh, provided by str onto the screen. After the write uh, system call completes then the execution is transferred back to the user space and the process uh, continues to execute. Uh, what is the difference between a system call uh, versus a standard uh, function call or procedure call? So for one important difference is that when we want to invoke a function in a program or uh, in a process, we use an instruction such as a call instruction. This is a standard x86 assembly instruction and uh, this will result in the function getting called and uh, after that function gets invoked, the, uh, it returns back to the calling function. In order to invoke a system call uh, however, we use a trap instruction such as the int 0x80. So int uh, here stands for interrupt or software interrupt and it results in the system shifting from the user space or the user space mode of operation to the kernel space. Okay. So the trap instruction causes the kernel uh, to be invoked and it causes uh, instructions in the kernel to then be executed. However, when we use the standard function call or the procedure call using the call instruction, there is no change uh, or shift. Uh, from user space to kernel space and so on. So it, uh, the execution continues to remain in the user space as it was before. Another very subtle difference between the system call and a standard procedure call or a function call is that the destination address or the destination function uh, which is invoked uh, can be at a relocatable address. So it could change every time 
the program is compiled and so on. However, with a system call, when a trap instruction is used, the hardware actually or the processor actually decides where the next instruction in the kernel space should get invoked. So, this is going to be fixed irrespective of what program is running, what operating system is running and so on. So, one crucial aspect when actually designing operating, operating systems is uh, what system calls should the operating system supports. Uh, we had seen that the only way a user processed could invoke a particular functionality in the operating system is through the system call interface. So, the question now comes that if a person is actually designing an operating system, so what are the interface that, an, uh, that the system call should support? So, one obvious uh, requirement is that the system call interface should have several sophisticated features, so that uh, a user process could actually very easily be able to interface or uh, invoke several uh, important functionality in the operating system. However, a, a different approach is to have a very simple system call interface and abstract whatever is necessary from the operating system. So, we will see in the next slide uh, a particular example in this. Okay, let us take an example of system calls that an OS supports uh, uh, for accessing files. So, as we know files are, are data which is persistent across reboots. So, these are data which is stored in the hard disk and could be read, uh, written or, or accessed using uh, functions such as f open, close, uh, read, write and so on. Every time you, we do an file open, uh, it would require that the hard disk be accessed. So, uh, a process would need to invoke a system call into the kernel and the kernel should actually take care of accessing the hard disk or uh, hard disk buffers or any other storage uh, medium to open the file and return back a pointer to the process. Uh, now, the question comes is how does a operating system designer decide what uh, system calls should be provided or supported in order to access files. So, some of the obvious things are like uh, there should be system calls to open a file, read or write to a file, um, there should be system calls to actually modify the creation date, set permissions and so on. The operating system could also support more complicated or more sophisticated operations such as uh, being able to seek into a particular offset within a file, uh, be able to link between files and so on. So, uh, these are the uh, essential requirements that a system call for handling files should support. On the other hand, operating system should be able to hide some details about the file. For instance, uh, details which should not be supported by system calls is like uh, uh, things such as like details about the storage media where the file is stored. For instance, whether the file is stored on a USB drive or a hard disk or a CD-ROM. This is actually abstracted out by the operating system and the user process would not be easily able to know uh, where uh, the file is stored. Another aspect which is abstracted out by the operating system is the ex exact locations uh, in the storage media. We will now look at how a typical operating system structure looks like. So, the operating system uh, suppose we consider this as this big uh, green block have uh, several modules built internally. For example, it would have a memory management module which manages all the memory in the system. Uh, it would have a CPU scheduling block. There is also the file system uh, management uh, module uh, which will control how the file systems such as the uh, those present in hard disk or uh, CD-ROMs are managed. So, you have a networking stack uh, which manages the uh, TCP IP network and you have something known as the interprocess communication module, uh, which would take care of processes communicating with each other. So, two important things which have not been mentioned as yet is the system call interface, which allows user processes to actually access uh, features or functionalities within each of these modules. Another aspect is the device drivers, which would take care of communicating with the hardware uh, devices and other resource hardware resources within the system. So, uh, this essentially is uh, all the different modules that uh, an operating system uh, supports. So, in, uh, in a monolithic structure of an operating system, all these various modules in the OS are, are present in a single addressable kernel space. So, what this means is that this is just one large chunk of code 
and all of them are uh, you could think of as one large uh, program uh, where all these modules uh, are present in. So, therefore, calling any function from the memory management to say the networking stack would just uh, mean a, a simple function call. Similarly, from the networking stack to the uh, device driver uh, would be another function call. So, this would is essentially the advantage uh, of having such a monolithic structure is that you could there is a direct communication between one module and another. On the other hand, uh, the kernel space becomes very large. So, uh, and uh, therefore, difficult to maintain and is likely to have uh, more bugs. So, a uh, typical operating system such as uh, Linux and xv6 and MS-DOS uh, uses a monolithic structure. So, uh, to take an example, the Linux uh, operating system or the Linux kernel has around 10 million lines of code. So, all this 10 million lines of uh, code uh, comprises of the entire kernel uh, Linux kernel which is actually present in this area. Another common structure of the operating system is known as uh, the microkernel structure, where the kernel is actually highly modular and every component in the kernel has its own addressable space. So, it is like having each of these as uh, independent processes and you have a very small microkernel which actually runs in the, uh, in the kernel space, which is in charge of uh, managing communication between each of these uh, processes and uh, also communication between user process and the operating system processes. So, the advantage here is that this microkernel is extremely small. So, ideally it, it is small enough to actually fit into the L1 uh, cache of the system itself. So, typically it would be uh, quite fast. However, the drawback is that um, uh, you now cannot have direct calls from say the file management to a device driver or rather like unlike the monolithic kernel where you could make direct function uh, invocation from a file management module to a device driver function. Here every invocation of that form should be through a communication channel known as an IPC or inter process communication channel. With this we would actually end uh, today's lecture and uh, from uh, the next lecture we will actually look uh, more about CPU sharing. Okay, thank you.